Come on, Drew. Good morning, I, I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, District 14 in the Bronx. I'm the proud chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee. Thank you for being here today to discuss the important topic of violence in New York City's detention facility. Before I begin my opening statement, I would like to thank the committee staff who have put this hearing together, Committee Council Josh Kinsley, Committee Analyst Willing Honkach, and the Committee Analyst uh, Daniel Crew. Uh, stated today hearing, uh, as stated, today's hearing will focus on violence in New York City's detention facility. The committee has always recognized the need for ad adequate care and comprehensive services for youth involved in, juvenile, in the juvenile justice system. Therefore, we will seek to learn how the department personnel are appropriately screened, trained, and supervised to properly oversee the city's detained juvenile population. The committee plans to also examine how the department investigates allegations or reports of violence within the secure detention facilities. This is for all forms of violence, including incidents involving youth on, on staff. We are, are all, we are in all uh, agreement that detained youth should be provided with appropriate attention and safeguards that help prevent violence within the department's facility. We are here today to learn what appropriate measures have, have been and or will be implemented by the department to further, further reduce violence within its facilities. It is paramount that youth are provided with the safest environment while awaiting adjudication as well as staff being afforded a secure work environment. I would now like to ask the representative of the department to please state their name for the record and for the committee council to administer the oath. Can you please state your names? Felipe Franco, <laughs> Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice. Stephanie Prusak, Associate Commissioner for Detention. Do you each swear to tell the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Ready? Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice. I'm Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice within the Administration for Children's Services. Thanks, for, thanks you for the opportunity to testify this morning. The safety and security of our young people and of, all, and of our staff are, paramount, are of paramount importance. It's only when staff and youth feel safe that we can achieve the therapeutic outcomes we want on behalf of the youth we serve. I look forward to sharing with you efforts at the Division of Youth and Family Justice has made to prevent violence and promote safety within our secure detention facilities. The Division of Youth and Family Justice oversees services and programs for youth at every stage of the juvenile justice process. Our continuum includes community-based preventive and alternative services for youth who are at risk of delinquency and their families. And we provide detention services to youth who are arrested and awaiting court resolution. Since 2012, we have been providing residential services for all youth placed with New York City as adjudicated delinquents. 
as well as aftercare services and supervision upon return to the community. ACS provides secure and non-secure detention, services for youth who have been arrested and are waiting for judges to hear their cases in court. The Division of Youth and Family Justice oversees seven non-for-profit provider agency operated non-secure detention group homes across the city, and they directly operates two secure detention facilities, Crossroads in Brooklyn and Horizons in the Bronx. Secure detention has the most restrictive security features and is typically reserved for youth who pose the highest risk or has been accused of committing serious offenses. Our non-secure detention residences solely serve juvenile delinquents, while our two secure detention centers serve both juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders. The number of young people admitted to detention has continued to decline over the last several years due to the smart policing practices leading to a decline in juvenile arrest in New York City, as well as the increased number of community-based alternatives designed to safely divert juvenile delinquents from the juvenile justice system. In 2010, not that long ago, 5,084 young people were admitted to detention for the calendar, calendar year. Since, the, since then, the admission to detention has decreased significantly, dropping to just 2,126 total admissions in fiscal year 2017, which represent a 32% decrease from fiscal year 2014. ACS values transparency in reporting outcomes for the agency's work, including detention outcomes, which are included in the Mayor's Management Report, MMR, that was released earlier this week. As a result of our historical low detention centers, <coughs> census, which continues to decrease, it is important to note that the rates report in a number of areas of the MMR appear elevated in comparison to actual numbers. For example, <laughs> while the child abuse are and or neglect allegation rate report reported on the MMR rose from 0 0.11 per 100 average daily population in fiscal year 2016 to 0 0.14 in fiscal year 2017, the actual number of allegations decreased from 65 in fiscal year 2016 to 61 in fiscal year 2017. The MMR also reflects a small increase of 0.04% from fiscal year 2016 to fiscal year 2017 in the youth on staff assaults with injury rate, which translates to only two additional incidents in fiscal year 2017 from the previous year 2016. While this is a very small increase, we take all incidents in our facilities seriously and recognize that there's always room for improvement. We are continuing efforts to procure and on-site intervention programs such as cure violence embedded within our secure detention at both secure detention sites. We are also, look, we are also working to hire additional frontline staff and improve staff training to emphasize the development of skills necessary to work with the high-risk population, which you will hear more about in the testimony. While youth crime in New York City has declined and the number of youth remanded to detention has decreased substantially over the last four years, the youth who are placed in detention are now the highest need youth in the city and present extremely challenging behaviors. Many have experienced significant trauma or abuse and have families with extensive child abuse and neglect histories. The vast majority, as high as 90% of the young people in the juvenile justice system, regardless of gender, have experienced some sort of trauma. To ad address this trauma, we strive to have a system that is both informed and responsive. Meaningful support for youth through targeted therapeutic programming, cultural services, and comprehensive educational programming helps to address their trauma, keep youth engaged, and prevent risky behavior, and keep our facilities safe. We are proud of our partnership with the Bellevue Hospital, NYU Langone Medical Center, and others to create and implement trauma-informed screening and care in our secure detention facilities, making us one of the first secure detention systems in the country to impre implement trauma-informed practices and training. Our work in detention is focused on helping youth 
we serve develop the skills to control and manage their emotions and behavior. We also recognize that the conditions of care in secure detention are strongly driven by the relationship between the youth and our staff. And we are committed to providing our staff to training and support the need to work effectively with our youth and maintain safety in our secure facilities. We have contracted recently with the New York Society for Prevention of Cruelty, Cruelty to Children to provide stress reduction secondary trauma workshops to our secure detention staff, as well as resiliency interventions after a critical incidents, incidents happen that began in October, that will be beginning in October 1st, 2017. In partnership with the ACS James Satterwhite Training Academy and with the support of the ACS Workforce Institute, we have improved and expanded our pre-service training that we offer to all juvenile counselors at the start of their employment with ACS. Now, more time is devoted to training staff on safe crisis management, a highly regarded crisis intervention model used across the country. We have pa we're partnering with external subject matters, experts like Bellevue Hospital to provide new training on mental health and trauma and their impact on the youth behavior with practical guidance to our staff for how to work with youth who have mental health needs. Behavior management theory and practice and on the job training experience alongside more senior juvenile counselors, mentors and JSA trainers to help the new staff learn the job while still in training. We are, partner, we are partnering with the John Jay College to provide a six, week, six weeks of peace officer training to all special officers who work in our detention facilities. I have partnered with the CUNY Public Safety Academy for a specialized training for our special officers and front end security in both facilities to improve practice, minimize incidents, and reduce contraband <coughs> coming into our facilities. Keeping our facilities safe is our top priority. And we have invested more resources than ever over reducing contraband and implementing best practices to increase safety and security. While there's no single solution to prevent contraband, our current, our current security protocols and investments in new technology are all meant to reduce the entry and prohibited items into our facilities. Security staff at each facility serves everyone who enters, staff, visitors alike, using magnetometers, wands, cell phone, and other wireless detective equipment. And we have increased random resident and facility searches. A staff uniform were altered to prevent staff from bringing contraband into the facility. And we added staff lockers to provide more storage for personal items. Our special officer management team and our tour, and our tour commanders carry cell phone detective equipment as they walk throughout the facility. And we have upgraded uh, this equipment to reflect the most technologically advanced equipment for detecting cell phones, even when they are shut off or the ba batteries are removed. The Division of Youth and Family Justice is working aggressively to implement a team staffing model of care adapted from the Missouri Youth Services Institute, MICE model, within our secure juvenile detention system. MICE is a nationally recognized therapeutic approach for working with young people involved in the juvenile justice system. Facilitated small groups, interaction, and processes, and the promotion of healthy productive relationships and interactions are at the core of the MICE group process. These approaches must be administered by caring, skilled, and well-trained staff <coughs> who work in multidisciplinary teams that include juvenile counselors, case management, and clinicians. These teams of staff working together are the key to helping youth make better decisions and manage their negative behaviors and thinking. We continue to partner with the Missouri Youth Services Institute to train all juvenile counselors and supervisors on the MICE model. One week of MICE training has been recently incorporated into our pre-service training program for juvenile counselors and MICE consultants provide on-site consultations to our detention staff year-round 
to improve their implementation of this model within our secure detention facilities. Division of Youth and Family Justice has employed Safe Crisis Management, ACM, as our crisis intervention methodology since 2012. ACM was selected over other tools largely because of its intensive focus on helping staff learn how to understand youth development and behavior, as well as prevention and de-escalation strategies that can be used to safely influence youth behavior in lieu of prior in lieu or on prior to the need of physical interventions. We created and will implement this year an enhanced safe crisis management training plan for secure detention and have contracted with the developer SEM to provide quarterly on-site training consultations <coughs> to improve staff practice of SEM. Through our partnership with NYU Bellevue, all secure detention staff receives training in working effectively with traumatized youth and strategies for preventing or mitigating vicarious trauma. The Division of Youth and Family Justice is pleased to continue our collaboration with NYU Bellevue to expand, expand trauma-informed care within detention through the use of evidence-based training for staff and skill development for residents. We are now in the initial phase of implementing Trauma Affect Regulation Guide for Education in Treatment, better known as TARGET. TARGET is a comprehensive trauma intervention specifically designed for use in juvenile justice settings. This effort is supported by a five-year grant from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration and is designed to increase staff understanding of trauma and its impact on the youth and staff, reduce institutional violence, and increase youth and staff members' sense of safety and provide frontline staff with the proven skills for managing the behavior of youth with trauma-related problems, as well as their own work-related stress reactions. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you targeted actions that the Division of Youth and Family Justice has taken to fortify safety and security in our secure detention facilities. New York City has a safe, secure detention system where youth go to school every day, where their medical and dental, and more than ever, their mental health needs are being met. Only the highest risk youth now reside in our facilities. And to maintain safety, we need to continue to invest in our staff and improve practices such as MICE, SEM, and trauma-responsive therapies. The investment we are making now to improve our practice, support our staff, and bol bolster safety in our facilities will strengthen the foundation of our system as the city enters into a new phase of juvenile justice with the implementation of Race to Age. As always, we're happy to work with the committee in our continuing effort to improve the system and provide services for city juvenile justice involved youth. We're happy now to take your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. First, uh, let me acknowledge that we've been joined uh, by Council Members uh, Perkins and Grodonchik. Uh, I will, uh, Commissioner, let me just start by stating uh, that I don't know anybody who uh, will not attest that in the last three and a half years we have seen uh, 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 a tremendous uh, improvement uh, under your leadership uh, with you and your staff and all the work that has been done. So I wanted to start by commending you and all your staff that work uh, day in and day out and all your work, um, it is a better place. I do have a few questions here that I want to address regarding uh, the issue before us. And the first one is, uh, according to the recently released mayor's management report, the percent of youth assaults on staff have more than doubled during the previous two fiscal years. Uh, can you share as to the reason for the increase and what steps are we taking? Um, and I'm looking specifically on the youth on staff assault uh, with injury rate uh, per 100 total ADP in detention that went from 0 0.05 to 0.11. The question is regarding youth on staff assaults? Yes. yes. 
And you're talking about the increase from 48 incidents in 2016 to 50 incidents in 2017? No, I'm talking uh, going back from 2015 to 2017. So when you put those numbers together, you go from 0 0.05 to 0.11. So that's how we end up with the double. Yeah, as I opened up before, I think it's important to keep in context the total number of incidents that we're talking about. Uh, we have to calculate the difference between 2015 to 2017. Having said that, I mean, either, even the change between 48 to 50 from 2016 to 2017 is too, too many. And as I mentioned before, we're committed to do everything that we can to maintain safe facilities. And we believe the best way to achieve that, which is what we're getting to do more than ever, is by investing in the stuff that makes the difference in the life of the kids. But what do you, what do you what, what's the uh, impetus? What, what's usually the catalyst for this youth on staff assault? Mm -hmm. Is there like a, a, a undercurrent that yeah, I mean, keep, keep you're in mind able to as assess? Yeah, Council Member, as I open up, um, you know, the city has done an amazing job of the reducing the number of kids who come to detention by more than 32%. As I also mentioned before, 90% of the youth that we serve have actually been victims of neglect and abuse. We're working with a population that actually violence has been ingrained into their day-to-day -day living. The job of our juvenile counselors and our clinicians and everyone else is helping young people that actually have seen violence as a way of communicating to learn new skills. Is By the nature of who we are, we're working with challenging youth that actually, and our job is to help them learn new ways relating to others. What are the repercussions when never youth assault a staff? We take that seriously and we immediately take care of the staff. And I think Stephanie Pluser can talk about our procedures in more detail. Okay. Well, we um, immediately assure that the staff is okay. We, um, we offer them any medical care if they need medical care. Um, um, if sometimes they feel they can stay, some Sometimes they feel they need to leave and seek outside medical care. Um, if it's an incident in which um, the staff feels okay and wants to try to debrief with the youth, um, and um, the youth and staff are amenable, we do uh, bring both together to try to um, find out why the incident occurred. And it often winds up with the youth apologizing to the staff member. I also want to emphasize, I mean, there's consequences to any inappropriate okay, behavior. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we take that seriously. I mean, there's actually ways of creating consequences within our behavior management system in detention. And keep in mind that all of youth in detention actually have court cases going on through the family court or the criminal court. And whenever one of these things happen, this is communicated to the court and has an impact in their case. So that's the biggest consequence. Is there any other concrete uh, consequences take place within the facility? Yeah, I mean, again, within their behavior, every case is individualized. Within the behavior management system, there's actually consequences and privileges that are lost. But I think more important, which is what we want to strive for, we actually use the opportunity to understand why the youth behave the way they behave. Yeah, what I'm concerned is, is there a demoralizing point for the staff where they don't feel safe, where they mm -hmm. feel like there was no real consequences that took place, mm -hmm. uh, just like there's consequences in families mm -hmm. at home. Yeah. You know, you, in essence, you have a family mm -hmm. uh, at a detention center. Um, what does that do to the morale? Have you done surveys on staff? Mm -hmm. And what was the outcome of those surveys regarding morale mm -hmm. uh, on youth, on staff assault? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we conduct a survey as part of a performance-based standards which we are part of um, in New York City. Um, the service results tend to indicate that staff feels safe. Um, having said that, um, more and more of our attention is in developing the right amount of skills for our staff. And consistently we hear from staff that they, they need further support, particularly more from their peers. We need more staff to serve the young people that we, we serve now. Do, do, do the staff get, and you mentioned debriefing, 
Uh, do the staff get debriefed by uh, a professional uh, whenever an incident takes place? What it, you mean, like a therapist, or yes, um, not necessarily at the moment. I we thought, have I supervisors thought. and and managers on staff. We do have um, clinicians that they can go and speak with if they so choose. Especially our uh, psychologists, our Bellevue staff have offered that service. Um, most folks, um, we have employee assistance program as well. And I believe the union also offers supportive counseling. In addition, um, through our new grant, we will be um, offering um, support to staff um, from, um, to teach them about their own trauma and, and, and the impacts to recognize it. And we're uh, contracting with, as I believe in the testimony, the chil what is it? The, uh, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty of Children, which actually have a team that have been available before to our uh, DCP workers upon traumatic events that will be now available to our staff in detention. Is, is that part of the culture? I mean, like, do you have data uh, that shows how many do go and get <laughs> debriefed through uh, staff? Because, mm -hmm. you know, this becomes a critical incident in their mm -hmm. lives. Uh, and it could spill over uh, to all the uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, young person and all the staff. Uh, and so I'm curious as to see how many of them uh, avail themselves to actually take the opportunity. Uh, as you're gonna hear later from Dr. Branson and others from Bellevue, many of these things are actually being put in place as we speak, and they're actually gonna be a f focus on actually helping staff deal with the trauma of incidents, but the trauma just working with kids who have been victimized before. So this is a new program you're about to? Yes. Okay, so we don't have it in place right now, right? Okay, uh, my, my last question before, I, I'm looking forward to hearing my colleagues with their questions, um, is related uh, to a case that was in the Daily News on August 31st uh, regarding uh, female staff uh, I, I'm curious, do we have cameras uh, in place in the entire facility? Yes, we do. And we're actually working with the Department of Design and Construction to ascertain any gaps or any needs for improvement of the equipment that we have now. When were the cameras up, uh, were, were installed? Do you happen to know? They've been there for a, a so they were long prior time, to this incident. And we've added more over the years. I'm just curious how an incident like that can actually take place and not be, you know, under an archive record of a video. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do have you had an opportunity to check uh, video records? This alleged allegation happened some years ago, and it just came to light. Again, we're working closely with the Department of Design and Construction to upgrade our equipment in the security center. So how, how long do you keep these videos archived, in um, archives? Our system right now can only keep video for uh, between three and 30 days okay. but on average. But having said that, if we, if we know of an allegation or there's an investigation going on by our partners at the Department of Investigation, those things are kept. I want to strongly encourage you to, you know where I'm going, <laughs> buy some terabytes, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> whatever it takes. It's really not that expensive uh, to be able, mm -hmm. uh, I, I imagine these cameras only record when there's movement. Yes. So therefore, they shouldn't take a whole lot of space. Mm -hmm. and, and probably, you probably have it in SD rather than HD. But even if you have an HD, it's, it's worth for either for the youth or for the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is, you know, this, it will mark them for the rest of their lives. Uh, so uh, is, is there a planning place uh, for us to archive this, let's say, for five years? Or yeah. 
Yeah, we couldn't agree more. I mean, in terms of protecting the youth, but particularly protecting our staff, video recording will help. And that's why we have engaged the city department of design and construction to do a thorough evaluation of our equipment and come up with recommendations and actually a capital plan to improve on them. Okay, thank you. Uh, council member? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, I want to follow up um, on the staffers. Do we keep records on how many people have been assaulted and need medical help outside of the facility? Is that, do we know about that? We keep records on staff who report that they were injured during an assault. So you have that information, okay. Um, one of the things that I didn't hear in the testimony this morning, um, and unfortunately, and I know Thrive New York, the city has been trying very much to meet head on the mental illness crisis. The, the children that are the young people that are under your uh, care, so to speak, um, are they, uh, they given mental health evaluations when they come in? And um, can you tell me what percentage of these young people have mental health issues? Ballpark? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have two different ways of looking at it. About 70% of the young people that we serve, when evaluated by the Bellevue team, have um, mental health diagnosis. And as I mentioned before, when we look at post-traumatic stress disorder, we have actually found numbers as high as 90% of the young people that we serve. So as the city continues to do well in just keeping in secure detention those kids who need it the most, we actually are getting more of a higher prevalence of kids with high mental health needs. Are there sep separate facilities for these young people? Are they all, you know, I just, I'm just curious about how they're treated. Because so many of them need mental health needs, we have actually invested in facility-wide investments on psychiatry, mental health, psychologists that are available to all young people that we serve. And how often do they see their, do they get treatment for the, how often do they see counselors? Does it as, vary? As often, yes, it depends on the individual child. Some youth see a therapist each, every day. Some youth uh, twice a week. Um, it, it really depends on the individual child and their needs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, um, <clears throat> I have a few questions. Um, so you mentioned something about violence in their day-to-day -day conditions mm -hmm. as part of uh, what you've uh, um, understand is what's happening. Give me an idea of what those conditions are that you're talking about. It's, it's yeah, I mean, specifically I, I, that make that make the difference. Go ahead. Sure, Council Member. I think the way I, I talked about it was that actually we in New York City have safe facilities where actually young people are going to school on a daily basis in very small classrooms where they're actually their educational needs are being met. They actually have state-of-the-art mental health services that we just talked about, and they actually have comprehensive. Um, after school youth development programming, um, actually provided by DYCD, the same folks who do this across New York City in our schools. The typical schedule of a kid, which you know is, is, is every minute is accounted for in meaningful opportunities to grow and learn. So their day-to-day -day conditions are not the conditions that at the detention place or the, the conditions in their community? What, what, what did you mean when you mentioned that? Today we're talking about the conditions within the detention sites. And there's violence in those detention centers? I would argue that there's not. I mean, there's that's why I was asking. So you were talking about violence in their day-to-day -day conditions. Is that in their community, in their family, or is it in the facilities that you have? That yeah, they I come think from communities where they're experiencing day-to-day -day violence? Is that what you're saying? I think I did mention in the context of 90% of the young people that we serve having been either neglected or abused, that many of them have experienced trauma. And, and, and but that's 90% of the kids? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is that total, 90% uh, of what total? Of the total population of, a deep, of uh, the two what? south and... I don't know, whatever population you're talking about. I will give you the number. Yeah, the population. I mean, of the two south... Yeah, over the 2,000 youth that we have met in a typical year, when we work with our partners and evaluate their likelihood of being exposed to violence, 90% of them 
have a history of violence and neglect. So do you have sort of demographic descriptions or information in, in terms of a, a profile of the neighborhood, the family, the schools, et cetera? Do, do you have that we could picture? Provide, sure, we could provide that information. Thank you. Would you please? Uh, how soon can I get that information, do you think? By tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Um, according to the recently released mayor's management report, the percent of youth assaults on staff have more than doubled during the previous two fiscal years. Can you explain why this is happening? And how is it being addressed? So I'm asking um, our numbers person. So the numbers between 2015 to 2017, Sarah, what are they? And, and between the 2029 incidents. Yeah, in 15 there were 29 incidents. In 17 there were 50. So yes. What did you say, 15? Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they went up from 29 in 2000, fiscal year 2015 to 15 to fiscal year 2017. That's uh, is that is that a rate that is no? This I'm giving you now the total number. So tw you are right. I mean, they do almost double, twenty nine to fifty. No, the number went down. No, it went up. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like it's moving up according to what. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I think you're correct. Fifteen and seven. Yeah. So how do we? What are we doing? How do we account for that? What? Yeah, I as I mean, as I opened up, I mentioned before, we are dealing with more of a risky population than ever before. Mm -hmm. And those why, that's why we are implementing the initiatives that we presented, such as the work with MICE, who has been proven to reduce violence in other jurisdictions, like Los Angeles, Louisiana, and elsewhere. We are working closely with our partners at Bellevue, and we're actually revamping our efforts with safe crisis management. There's a more risky population that you're encountering today than in the past. So d give me the differences to some extent that you can account for, that you can identify between the riskiest of today versus the less risky of another period. What's happening that's different that makes them riskier? Yeah, I mean, the likelihood of a, of a young person making it to detention is less than before, as I opened up before. I mean, for example, a good way of thinking about this, not that long ago, 50% of the young people in detention, secure detention, were juvenile delinquents. Today, 71% of the, of the youth in secure detention are juvenile offenders. By the nature of their placement, they come through the criminal court and they are placed with us because of serious felonies. So can you, do you have like a, a, a sort of demographic profile of the neighborhoods and uh, the family and the schools? We, we, we have information that we will make to you available by tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you uh, so much, Council Member Perkins. Uh, I just have a couple of more questions. Can, can you give us the percentage of allegations of assault slash abuse by youth counselors uh, that are substantiated? Last year it was, there was a 30% substantiation rate. That means that only one out of every three allegations are substantiated. Uh, how does that compare to previous years? Um, I believe it's going up slightly. Um, the Justice Center now um, is responsible for uh, investigating and indicating, and they have a, a um, lower level of indication, of uh, criteria for indication, for example, a a level three indication, which the majority are, would not register on um, the VPCR, so that it, Can you it, mention codes that I, I'm sorry, I, that uh, I'm confused uh, about. So uh, if you could explain the levels and the uh, VCR. <laughs> right, unlike OCFS used to um, uh, investigate child abuse allegation for the state, now uh, a new, the Justice Center does that their registry is called the Vulnerable Children, uh, Child Protection Registry, um, uh, Vulnerable Person Child Registry, VPCR. 
and that's like the uh, what used to be the uh, state central registry SCR. So um, they investigate all uh, incidents of child abuse all day. Do, do, can you account why are, are we getting uh, full, more false allegations than before? I, th I think it's the other way around. Oh, the other way around. Yeah, so we maybe we're getting, and again, I think it's a change in practice. I mean, the, historically it used to be reviewed and investigated by OCFS. Uh, the state created the Justice Center, which actually is a separate agency that actually has a significant amount of resources just to do investigations. And actually that, that has created a different threshold, much, much higher than before. So the, so the criteria has changed. Yes. Sir, yes. So we're kind of not comparing it's apples potential with potential for harm is the criteria. I see. So, it's, so what you're saying is kind of hard to compare the numbers from, let's say, two years mm -hmm. ago with this year's because the criteria has changed. Yes. When did the criteria, the criteria get changed? <laughs> it just, it's just the thoroughness of the investigations done by the Justice Center. And that just happened when? Um, 2013, we believe, but I will double check. The, what the Justice Center was created by Governor Cuomo. Okay, so the last four years then is being pretty steady. Mm -hmm. So that still wouldn't account why the numbers have changed in the la within the last four years. I, I, yeah, and again, the rate of substantiation has changed. I don't know if it has changed in any significant way. So when we look at the numbers, I mean, that difference between 26% to 30%, that actually translate between 17 cases that were substantiated the previous fiscal year to 18 cases that were substantiated this one year. More. So we're okay. talking about one more case. Okay, gotcha. All right, uh, last question I have, okay. unless my colleagues have another question, uh, is related uh, to the progress. What progress have been made to retrofit detention facilities to allow for transfer for adolescents from Rikers Islands to ACS managed facilities? So as, as I mentioned before, we're cl working closely on a daily basis with the Department of Design and Construction. Um, actually, design has actually taken place for Horizons, and I believe that actually some of the, the repairs are actually began at Horizons, and they are also gonna start at Crossroads. And the anticipated day of completion will be? We need to get everything done that we need to get done by October 2018. And you believe that we'll be able to finish? We're working hard at it. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Again, thank you for all that you do uh, and for taking care of our youth and our detention center. And with that, we'll have our next uh, panel. And we'll last. Uh, from the city controller's office, Eric. Lemos, did I say that right? Mr. Eric Lemos, controller's office. If you're here, you could come. Not here. Okay. Are you Eric Lemos? Okay, great. No? no? Oh, okay. All right. No problem. <laughs> That's why you, you look like you had the, the look of a deer uh, when lights are coming. All right. So with that, we have James da Davis. I think this is Davis. I'm sorry. From ACS. And Christopher, Dr. Christopher Brown for NYU School of Medicine. You may begin as soon as uh, you're ready. You have a PowerPoint, right? Uh, do you like to use, or you just? I have a PowerPoint. Okay. So if the sergeant 
Sergeant O'Varns could help us with that. Be very grateful. Okay, you can begin as long as you're ready. If you could turn the mic on, I think it's off. I think. Is it on now? Now okay. it is. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the juvenile or the juvenile justice committee. Um, I'm James Davis. I'm a senior consultant with uh, the Missouri Youth Services Institute that uh, Commissioner Franco was talking about. Uh, the abbreviation of that is MICE. Uh, it's an honor to speak before this committee and engage in a discussion about what's best for the young people of New York City. Uh, after 35 years working with juveniles in the state of Missouri, I retired and, and, and most thankful for the youth and the staff that acted as my mentors, especially in my early years. The kids taught me more than anything, so I always, I always enjoyed working them. Um, uh, so I, at, after that, Mark Stewart, who is the director of MICE, invited me to be part of the vision of you from, he was the director of the vision of youth service for 17 years. Uh, and he's always been a youth advocate and he invited me to join MICE uh, to provide consultation and training uh, for systemic change in other states. So we've been in several states. We just happen to be in New York now. Uh, I don't work for ACS, I work for my C, I'm a contractor, so I'm not an ACS staff. Um, so uh, when Mark offered me that opportunity, it was a dream come true for me to come to New York City, be a part of this process. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, I joined MyC in 2008 after my retirement and uh, became involved in New York City's Close to Home Project in 2012. Uh, that's when we were establishing a program uh, with OCFS called Brooklyn for Brooklyn. Uh, this was the transition period for close to home as young offenders were moving uh, from upstate secure facilities to the close to home facilities in the city. And that was putting them closer with their families, which was the major part of it in, in smaller units. Uh, my role was and still is uh, coordinating a team of six MICE consultants who were training and coaching the close to home private pr provider net network. Over the past two years, my responsibilities expanded to include training of all staff within ACS, ACS's two secure facilities, Crossroads and Horizons, uh, on the Missouri model. And we're not trying to bring a model to New York. We're trying to bring the best practices of the Missouri model to New York. Um, and so uh, those practices are what we're out there training and coaching in. Uh, before I describe the work that I've been doing in detention, I'd like to provide a brief description of MICE, the MICE model itself. Uh, MICE's goal is to provide a safe, secure environment to facilitate their therapeutic change. Uh, and this is accomplished through the work in four areas. Um, the first area is leadership in their organizational structure, uh, safety, supervision, and structure, group work and facilitation skills, and facility environment. Um, these basic pillars form the foundation of the MICE approach and they're inter interconnected to establish and maintain a safe environment for growth and change. Relationships are always the key to the approach when staff and youth see the same faces every day and they build a community, they get to know each other, uh, which is at the root of it. We all know that these youth have some difficulties managing relationships, and so you, get, you remember when you showed up as substitute teachers, what happened, so we want the same staff, same faces, working with the same youth all the time. Um, we started the training and we trained the teams as a team. So we started training rounds of training and each team, the complete team was in there, the, the staff, frontline staff, the therapist, everybody was in the training. And so we had one team and one vision. Uh, that continues through weekly unit team meetings. And when new staff are assigned, we make every effort to make them, schedule them consistently in the same unit. This consistency offers stability and provides opportunity for relationship building. Um, <coughs> Youth are supervised 24 seven by staff utilizing eyes on supervision and therapeutic positioning. This combination of supervision, structure, and engagement 
places staff in the best position for early intervention and relationship building. We want them structured and engaged with eyes on supervision at all times. Uh, the peer group is also an essential, is essential and it acts as a change agent for safety and change. We believe safety is everybody's role and responsibility. Uh, when 10 or 12 youth live together, a peer group will inevitably emerge as an influential component. Um, the recognition of the peer influence and the intentional development of the positive culture of the group influences on other peer group, uh, other peers in the group uh, to maintain safe environment. Throughout the day, we facilitate check-ins, which is a assessment of the, of the uh, group atmosphere, the environment, significant issues. Um, and the tone of the youth in the group. Um, their peer group um, is, is essential. Uh, when an issue arises, uh, circle ups are used. We pull the group together for a circle up to resolve conflicts, organize activities, movements while recognizing strengths and progress. Um, each night, there is a 60 to 90 minute group meeting uh, facilitated by a trained staff. Uh, during that meeting, youth in the group uh, have and they address issues more thoroughly and go deeper into develop skill sets and core competencies. For example, most of the youth have challenges with managing their anger and how to channel it. Um, the group will explore origins of the anger, identify a safety plan, and then strategies for de-escalation, and then make a commitment about how they'll help that person uh, with those skill sets. Uh, during these two years in the, in the uh, working with Crossroads and Horizons, we provided follow-up coaching and implementation for, and for sustainability. This included a leadership training, uh, as well as training resulting in an increased team cohesion, improved definition of roles, therapeutic planning using the line of movement, which is basically how to, what, what's under the behaviors, what's causing the kids, the youth to act the way they're acting. Uh, regular staff uh, facilitated check-in, circle-ups, and wrap sessions, as well as uh, unit group activities. We believe staff must be safe in order for youth to be safe. Um, we have a saying, if one's not safe, no one's safe. So we, that's our motto. Uh, safety for staff looks more like security. Enhancing staff security requires supervision and feedback on performance and a sense that their colleagues are concerned about everyone's well-being. Uh, reporting to the same team each day with the same youth provides added security because staff get to know the youth, their triggers, and what coping skills uh, to keep the unit safe. Lastly, security means going home at the end of the shift to their families having made a difference with the youth's life. They all signed up to make a difference with young people's lives. Um, staff, safety from my perspective is not an incident driven set of events. Instead, safety is a 24 seven process. Uh, you have to know program to know safety in, their, in that context. Uh, how do staff treat the youth? How do they greet the youth? How well do team members interact and work together? Does the unit feel tense like something might happen? Uh, how does staff position themselves? When staff enter the unit, how do young people introduce themselves? Uh, does the living area look clean, neat, organized? Is the language respectful? Are youth engaged? Does the group know and understand the schedule and so that they can prepare? Uh, do youth help each other? Does it seem that staff are engaged, ready to move if needed, but not on edge waiting for an incident? Uh, what is the conversation between the youth and staff? Uh, do frontline staff believe they are a change agent, or are they just there to observe and report? So they need to have meaningful involvement in the role. Um, IC helps to develop all these components in juvenile justice settings uh, to create a safe and secure space for youth and staff. Uh, we look forward to continuing our work with ACS and with the partners at Bellevue and JKM to improve best practices within the secure detention setting uh, in New York City. Uh, once again, I thank you for your time and your an opportunity to discuss the best interest of youth in New York City. Are you ready? Good morning. So, good morning, members of the committee. And the rest of y'all, it's a uh, real pleasure to be here. My name is Dr. Christopher Branson. I'm a child psychologist and assistant professor at New York University School of Medicine. And I'm gonna be talking about the uh, trauma-informed care work we're gonna be doing in detention with a particular emphasis on what we're gonna be doing for staff. 
So real quick, I won't bore you with my background, but uh, I myself am a former juvenile offender. It's the whole reason I became a psychologist, so I can tell you that safe facilities are very important to me. Um, you know, I was, I think ACS brought me on uh, because I have expertise in juvenile justice, trauma-informed care. Over the past five years, I've been a consultant or investigator on 13 uh, trauma-informed care projects in eight different states. So over the past five years here in New York City, I've done work with Rikers Island. I'm the lead on the first NIH-funded study of trauma-informed care ever, uh, and it involves the New York City Department of Probation, two diversion programs, a drug treatment court. So I recently finished training every single probation staff in Brooklyn in the skills that we're gonna be bringing to detention with the plan to spread it to the other four boroughs. And next week, I'll be going up to Albany in the state capitol to talk about taking the model we're developing here in New York City and spreading it throughout the entire state juvenile justice system. I've also done work in several other states. Uh, it's in the slides, so I won't read through that. So before I get into the specific plans, I just want to provide some context. You know, the challenges we're talking about here in New York City are not unique to our city. This is the same challenges facing uh, leaders of detention correctional systems across the country. I know that from working with them personally. I just completed a survey of juvenile correctional administrators, got some responses from 37 states, and I know the, data, the research data inside and out. So according to statistics from the US Department of Justice, correctional officers experience the second most workplace violence of any profession in this country behind police officers. They also get, you know, so that's getting assaulted, witnessing violence, hearing about traumatic incidents, hearing about traumas in the lives of the kids that they serve. And all of that, you know, makes them very vulnerable. Uh, and as a result, there's extensive research showing that 25 to 60 percent of frontline correctional staff will develop significant symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So to give you context, if you look at the U.S. adult population, only 7% will ever develop PTSD in their lifetime. So the rates of PTSD among staff are similar to those of the kids in these facilities as well as military veterans returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. And if we don't do something about it, it can have a major toll on their mental and physical health, their job performance, their personal lives, their quality of life, and when you have a lot of traumatized people in one building, kids and staff, it's bound to be combustible. But there's good news. We can do something about it. Research shows that staff who feel supported by their organizations, who have adequate training, who work in an organization where they do something to address these issues, are less likely to develop these negative outcomes. They're still gonna be exposed to trauma, Doubt we're ever gonna see a day where there's zero violence or incidents in these kinds of facilities, but it doesn't have to inflict lasting damage on the important people who run these facilities. So trauma-informed care is a movement that's taken hold nationwide since about 2000. And it's really, it goes beyond just providing treatment for kids who have trauma-related issues, but it's changing the whole way that the, you know, organizations operate, the way they provide services, their policies, how they manage behavior. We need everyone in these facilities to be knowledgeable about trauma, have specific skills for responding to it, and we need to make sure that nothing that we're doing adds new trauma to the lives of kids or staff or exacerbates existing trauma. So this is a, you know, a significant shift in organizational culture and practice for most facilities across the country, uh, and it's a process. So, key elements of a trauma-informed justice system are listed here. Uh, and again, the one I'm really gonna focus on today is number four, so staff safety and traumatic stress prevention. And I have to second what my colleague said, you know, the research shows in my experience, I've come to believe that staff safety is the foundation of a trauma-informed and safe agency. It's kind of like when you get on an airplane and they're given the emergency instructions, if the oxygen mask falls, Parents, put yours on first before you put it on the kid. It's the same thing. Staff have to feel safe and supported in order to create a safe environment for youth. So just so you don't think this is something I made up in my ivory tower office, this is a list of stakeholders at the national and local level uh, who support trauma-informed care. It's pretty much a who's who. Um, 
All right, so let's get to the details, the plan. So uh, Commissioner Franco spoke about this. I'm gonna give you some more details. Uh, one of the things I really wanna highlight is you know, consultation with leadership of these facilities on developing organizational strategies to promote staff wellness, increase safety, and I'm gonna give you really specific examples in a minute. Uh, also, Target. So Target's a treatment for kids who have symptoms of traumatic stress, but then the great thing is the developer of Target created T4, which is designed specifically for people who aren't therapists, frontline staff in juvenile justice. Uh, and we're also gonna be doing Target groups for families. So Target is the only trauma-informed model that's included in the U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention's Model Program Guide. It's the reason that I chose to start implementing this when I started doing this work back in 2012. Um, and based on my experience here in New York City, I still think that it's the best model available in terms of trauma-informed care. So these are the four steps of T4. So staff are taught, and we're gonna teach every staff member who interacts with kids uh, or interacts with other staff members in these facilities, in these skills. And this is what I've already trained over 500 uh, professionals in New York City in these skills. So skills for recognizing when a kid is having a trauma reaction. What are the early warning signs? You know, it's easy to recognize when a kid starts throwing punches, but it's a little late to intervene and de-escalate at that point. So we want them to catch it even earlier before it even turns into violence. Giving them very specific skills for this is how you de-escalate, this is how you engage a youth, this is how you get them to cope. And the great thing about it is there are also skills to help staff manage their own stress reactions. You know, imagine running into a unit and seeing some, you know, big incident, you know, a big fight. Imagine your heart pumping, the adrenaline, you know, going through your veins. If you're not at your A game and thinking clearly at that moment, you might run in and escalate it, unintentionally do something that makes it worse. So these skills help staff manage their own reactions so they're not reacting out of fear or anger, but reacting with best practices. And beyond the data, which I'm gonna share a little bit of with you in a minute, the reason I believe in this, because correctional officers at Rikers Island tell me it works. Probation officers tell me it works. Staff I've trained in other states tell me that they've been able to prevent potential riots and fights and get kids to apologize and feel safer and more effective in their jobs. And again, because we're gonna be doing target groups with kids, so they're gonna learn these skills. Then they're gonna go out into the unit where every single staff member knows the same skills, can help remind children about kids about the skills and help them practice. But then we're doing groups with the parents so that when kids return to their homes, their parents can continue reinforcing these skills. And the parents can use them themselves. Many of these parents have trauma histories of their own. Managing a teenager in general is challenging, but if your kid has PTSD, it's even more so. So the evidence. Uh, so they implemented Target plus T4 statewide in Connecticut's juvenile detention system and found significant reductions in use disciplinary infractions reduction in the use of isolation, so they didn't have to fall back on those harsh traditional punishments, and statewide recidivism went down. Uh, when they did this in Ohio, youth on staff aggression went down, use of physical restraint, use of isolation, improvements in youth mental health services, satisfaction with services received. And I wanna point out that in both of those projects, they only did T4 and Target. They didn't do any of the extra organizational strategies to address stress, staff trauma that we're gonna be doing here. Now for my own ongoing project in New York City, uh, preliminary data shows that our model has led to a significant increase in staff ratings of perceived safety within the organization and perceived support from leadership, which I think is exactly what we're all talking about. Um, and this is just a graph uh, from the Ohio study. So the, the line on top is the unit that didn't do trauma-informed care. They just kept doing the, what they usually do. The line on the bottom is the unit that implemented uh, trauma-informed care. So you see big reductions. So let's get real specific. So there are a number of potential strategies that we can implement, and I'll detail them in a second, but we are not, our approach is never one size fits all, because every site is different. 
And so we start by doing a baseline organizational assessment. So we're going to anonymously survey every single staff member in the facility using a measure that I've developed and validated and getting ready to publish. And it includes questions about do they feel safe? Do they feel supported? Is their leadership doing enough to prevent secondary trauma? There's also a place for just open comments, feedback, and we're doing it anonymously so that you know, people don't have to fear retribution you know, for giving uh, honest opinions. And I can tell you from past experience, when you do that, staff will be honest with you. You'll get some real feedback. And based on those results, we're gonna figure out, work with leadership and the frontline staff to figure out what's the best plan. So some of the possibilities. One that we're definitely gonna do is a protocol for staff debriefing. So when there is a violent incident, a critical incident on site that has the potential to inflict lasting harm on staff and kids, it's not just going to be about, you know, incident reports or the Justice Center investigation or, you know, liability. It's going to be, is everyone okay? We're going to check in with each other. It's not going to be pointing fingers, whose fault is this? Because these incidents happen. But it's going to be coming together to make sure staff have the support that they need. We're also, you know, another possibility is implementing staff forums. So giving a regular space for the frontline staff to share their concerns, security issues, or their ideas for making the facility better. Because I tell you, I've talked to hundreds of frontline staff across the country, and they have brilliant ideas about what needs to change, and we need to give them a voice. And when, you know, one of the tenets of trauma-informed care is voice and choice. It's not just for the kids. The staff need to feel like they have voice and choice in influencing how the environment they work in is shaped. We also could train supervisors to address staff stress and wellness in team meetings or supervision. You know, I'm a psychologist and we talk about our feelings all the time. It's normal for us, but in the justice system, it's not the norm to get into your stressors and things like that in supervision. But it's needed because it's one of the most difficult jobs there is. On-site peer support groups is another uh, possibility, something I've done with agencies I've worked with. Also continuing ed workshops, you know, teaching additional skills that support staff wellness, their ability to manage stress, so stress management, mindfulness meditation, yoga, training on, you know, working with youth with mental health issues. But then those are, a lot of those things are preventative, but there are gonna be staff who go on to develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And we can't just let them flounder. We have to do something about it. So, you know, my team has been pulling together. We've been vetting uh, every New York City mental health center that we can to find out who are the people who really have expertise in treating PTSD. We don't want to just give staff a, a long list of numbers of random therapists. We want to send them to the best of the best because they deserve it. And last, you know, this may sound like a small thing, but recognizing staff successes. Because staff in these centers, they only get publicized when there's something in the New York Post or on the night news. No one ever talks about the kid who sends them a wedding invitation years later because that staff meant so much to them. It's one of the reasons, and staff, they care about these kids and they beat themselves up when something bad happens, I can tell you personally. So we need to recognize them for the good work that they do. We need to support them. Because I gotta tell you, I'm a former juvenile offender. I didn't get into this business to help juvenile justice staff, but the longer I do this work, the more I truly believe, unless we do right by them, we are never gonna do right by our kids. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I'm glad that you end up uh, with staff successes, because last year uh, we had the opportunity to honor in both detention center uh, centers uh, the staff uh, and it was really over the top, uh, the, um, the accolades and the presentation. That when I walked in, I was really, really pleased, and we gave citations to all the staff, and, and I agree with you. Uh, who, don't, who, who does not want to be affirmed uh, that what you're doing uh, makes a difference? I think at the end of the day, we all want to feel like we're making a difference. I have a quick question regarding two things. Uh, your graph, uh, the tick increases safety in juvenile justice facility. I notice when you see the graph, they were both going up. Uh, you introduce 
uh, the trauma informed tick uh, program, and then it went down. But I noticed the control group started going down as well, and they both started going up at the same time. Uh, was there an incident uh, in the facility that contributed to that? And though it's a success to be able to say you have seven versus, I imagine, 18. Uh, and so how do you control for that? So this was a Ohio study. It wasn't one that I was involved in, uh, but I know the investigator very well. She's a close colleague of mine. So my understanding is, uh, number one, when they decided, the reason they actually implemented this is because the state was being sued because a child unfortunately died uh, mm -hmm. in one of their facilities. And they were facing a challenge of uh, an increasingly complex population. So uh, Commissioner Franco was talking about that. And it's something we see in juvenile and adult uh, prisons across the country. More and more mental health issues compared to the past, partially because our system, mental health system, is not adequate. Um, and so, uh, you know, at the time they implemented this, uh, they were starting to get a more complex population. But the actual, the uptick in the beginning for, uh, you know, trauma-informed doesn't surprise me because it's, you know, there's a steep learning curve and it's a big shift and not everyone buys in right away. You know, I can tell you when I went to Rikers Island, you know, I wouldn't say the majority were buying what I was selling the first time I spoke to them. But when they saw some of their coworkers use it and it worked and they didn't have to pull out their pepper spray or their nightsticks, that's when they start to believe. And how long that took, I'm just curious. What, to get uh, other people on board? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Rikers Project's on hold now because of uh, our change in commissioners, and, you know, so I won't get into that too much. Uh, okay. But I'll say it depends on the place. There, you know, I've worked with agencies where very quickly people buy into this. Um, at probation, you know, it's taken a little bit more time, but... But what's, what's that number? I mean, we, we, uh, a week might be, you know quick to you, it might be long to me, a month, a year, what are we talking about? So I think in a year, you know, you can hope to see the majority of staff bought in and using these skills That's reasonable. regularly. That's uh, reasonable in any organization. Yeah. Uh, my other question was related to, you mentioned that you do an organization assessment, which I think is brilliant, uh, but is there an ongoing, uh, and that's why I was looking at that graph, that a year later, is there a need to do another organization assessment because things do change, staff change, yes. leadership changes. <laughs> so if you do that, and how do you go about doing that? Absolutely, so with all of the work that I do, you know, we collect data to evaluate the outcomes because I need to know that this works. I don't wanna do it because it well, sounds okay. good to me, but if it doesn't actually improve the lives of these kids and these staff, then I don't wanna waste any more time. Uh, so we're gonna be, as part of the grant that funds this project, we had to write a detailed evaluation plan. We're gonna be collecting data at multiple points. We are gonna re-administer the organizational assessment surveys. We're also gonna be looking at facility data, PBS data, um, measuring youth symptoms. So we have multiple indicators, absolutely, because for me, this has to stick, you know? And you can't just train everyone and then leave and hope for the best. That's not gonna work. So we're here, this is a five-year project, and we are gonna be, you know, working with them closely. And we don't even, you know, we don't wait until the follow-up period to get data. We're talking with staff constantly, and they're letting us know there's a problem with this, there's a hiccup with this, so that we can shift course earlier. I don't want to collect data nine months down the road and all the staff tell me, yeah, this was terrible and a waste of time. Right. So we, you know, we collect anecdotal data, you know, we talk to everyone. This is really a collaborative process. This isn't, you know, NYU Bellevue coming in telling folks how to do it. We're working with them because they're experts on their facility. Indeed. And so we're going to work together, try to make the best plan possible. And I'm happy, I'm sure if you were here earlier, you, you heard me mention about debriefing staff. Yes. Look, I, I was involved with 9-11, I was involved with Flight 587. The biggest lesson I learned Flight fly, 587 uh, when it went down, I was there for 12 hours dealing uh, with the families. Uh, I remember getting into my car 
uh, with my wife, and my wife asked me, how did it go? And I was getting ready to say something. I just started crying, and just uncontrollably. And the next day, you know, I talked to my colleagues and to uh, the supervisor and the Red Cross. He goes, oh, we forgot to do something. I said, what was that? And he goes, he forgot to debrief and talk about our experience. Uh, that was an invaluable lesson for me. Uh, the next day, we were at the Javis Center. We went through the process. I walked out. And I remember saying, I'm okay. And imagine all the staff there. They are literally every single day dealing with you know critical incidents that are we think is in a kind of a control environment, but is you know the anxiety, is the fear factor that we're dealing with. Uh, so I'm very very happy to hear. Now, a question for both of you, and I close with this um, for this panel is what what do you see as the most important step that we need to take uh, moving forward at this point? With this, I think we're just going to do the ongoing team meetings, team unit management where the units stay together and uh, and n cut down on movements of kids, keeping kids in the same unit, keeping staff together, I think that will carry it forward. And part of the team meeting, to have a weekly team meeting, part of that is the debriefing and taking care of each other and talking about what happened, what, how did that, how was that incident handled, uh, and not just the ones that we handled wrong, but the ones we handled well, because there's too much focus on just the ones we don't handle, but the ones we handled well, we won't talk about those. So people say, well, that, that's the practice we're looking for. Mm. Very good. And for my part, I'd actually say, uh, I think the organizational assessment, because I can't, you know, again, I'm an outsider, and the staff, I need them to tell me what they need, how they're doing, what kind of supports are working, what's not working. You know, otherwise, I'd just be offering an educated guess. Um, and I really believe you, you have to listen before you act, so. Very good. Thank you, both of you, for your service and uh, for the impact that you're making and you will be making. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. With that, we have our next panel. Christine Bella and Nancy Ginsberg from the Legal Aid Society. Welcome, ladies. You may begin as soon as you're ready. I think the microphone is off. No, it's off. Try now. How about now? There you there go. I can hear the difference. Thanks. So good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Bella. I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. And I'm here with Nancy Ginsburg, who is the director of the Adolescent Intervention and Diversion Project in the Criminal Defense Practice of the Legal Aid Society. So we thank you, Chair Cabrera, and the committee for holding this hearing about the important topic of violence in the secure detention facilities and the need for greater oversight. So um, this is especially important now um, and emergent because of, um, in light of the city's plans to remove all the 16 and 17 year olds from Rikers Island, as well as the state's Im imminent plans to raise the age of criminal responsibility for some 16 and 17 year olds in New York City. So we must address the problems um, with violence in the secure facilities now. Um, our testimony is informed by daily contacts that we have with detained youth, our clients, their families, ACS, DYFJ, uh, officials, and staff at the facilities. And in our testimony today, um, you have our written testimony, but we'd like to speak about um, and emphasize the root causes that may be driving the violence uh, the violent incidents that you've heard about, insecure detention both by youth and by staff. And um, violence in secure facilities presents in many different ways to, to youth. So um, we have to also consider um, what youth tell us. So youth complain of physical and mechanical restraints. They um, characterize incidents that can be described as excessive force by staff and assaults by staff. They also describe assaults by other youth. So um, we have to look at violent incidents across many different um, measures. So our, also, our clients also report that even when staff are aware of a threat by a youth, um, say another youth, they sometimes fail to intercede, um, and that would lead to further conflict. We have heard from youth sometimes that staff may instigate conflicts, which leads to violence. 
So all of, um, we say all of that because we, we, we really need to look across the board, um, not just at the youth, who uh, I understand may be responsible for some of the violence in the facilities, but really let's look at the root causes, let's look at what is driving the incidents, and let's look at what we can do for both youth and staff in the facilities. Um, the, the prior panel really, I think, um, echoed what we um, believe is critically important is providing this trauma-informed care, and that trauma-informed care must be presented to both youth and staff as well. So we know that um, effective training and supervision and trauma-informed care are necessary tools for the successful management of these facilities, and we urge ACS to continue um, its efforts in that regard. We want to see um, staff better able to de-escalate conflicts and um, violent incidents. We want to see staff better able to respond with behavioral interventions and modifications, and we also want to see collaborative responses with mental health, and we want to see restorative practices um, and interventions. We um, prefer that uh, to uh, having our clients, uh, young people arrested in facilities, which often may be a consequence of some of the incidents that you've heard about. So in addition to reports from youth um, and staff, the scope of violence can also be measured by the data. You heard a lot about the data today, so we won't go on about that, but the data can help identify trends that occur at the facilities, such as evaluating where and when um, violent incidents occur and which staff are involved and which youth are involved and sort of drilling down on the data. These trends can allow management to discern, among other things, the need to reevaluate the level of staffing. Do they need an increase in staffing? We suggest they do. Um, do they need increase in supervision and programming? We suggest they do, and all of that um, in an effort to provide youth with a um, safer environment and also to keep youth occupied um, during their detention. So a lot of what um, we talked about earlier really focused on the consequences for um, violent incidents as they uh, pertain to youth, but we, um, again, want to talk about the root causes. So restraints. Um, mechanical and physical restraints do occur in detention, and it's well recognized that these restraints come with inherent risks, risks such as uh, exposure to trauma, physical injury, and even death in facilities. So it's important that we look at um, the, uh, the needs of the youth that are exposed to this violence. We find now that the needs of detained youth are greater than those um, in the general public. We've heard about that extensively again from the commissioner, of the deputy commissioner this morning. Um, we know that mental health needs of youth in detention are significant. What we also know is that these so-called aggressive kids do not present with just one single need. But research tells us that these youth are dealing with a host of other problems which include mental health needs and educational needs and exposure to trauma. We also acknowledge that staff, as we heard from uh, Dr. Branson, also come to the job with similar needs. They come to the job from similar communities. The communities that we know um, that drive um, admissions to detention, such as Bedford-Stuyvesant, East New York, Harlem, the South Bronx, and the Rockaway, these neighborhoods share significant problems of poverty, inadequate services to meet the high needs of its residents, low performing schools at times, and higher than average um, rates of health, mental health issues, and violence. And that instability um, also exposes youth to trauma. We also um, want to emphasize the need for um, oversight. So it, while it's important that ACS provide training, increase its staff, increase its programming, and provide supports for both its staff and the youth in the facilities, we see a need for oversight in the facilities and independent oversight. The city has developed a more therapeutic approach, certainly, and we are very encouraged by that, um, but no system, no matter how well-intentioned, is immune from problems. So what we would like to see is independent oversight that would shine a light on the serious problems, but also give a voice to youth and staff, as Dr. Branson said, give both staff and youth a voice and choice in the governance um, within the facilities, and independent oversight would provide that opportunity. Incarcerated youth are often socially isolated and unaware of their rights and unable to effectively assert them. 
we know that from our experience that they don't tend to report abuses and often accept abusive treatment as a norm in a particular facility. They live under rigidly controlled environments that allow only limited um, and highly supervised contact with the outside world, thus leading to further reluctance for them to report. They do not utilize the resident advocate program we know, which is one um, avenue for them to report uh, abuses within the facilities, as the resident advocates are staff of ACSDYFJ and are embedded in the facilities, and in the view of um, youth, too close to other staff. So while ACS is subject to oversight from certain governmental agencies, including the council they, and OCFS, as well as the Justice Center, we think independent oversight would provide um, sort of more uh, a broader look at the problems within the facilities and also more transparency. Um, effective oversight um, would include uh, as essential elements the following independence, unfettered and confidential access to staffing and resources, um, additional staffing, um, the power and the duty to support findings and recommendations to the public, so not just being able to evaluate the problem, which many of these internal um, governmental agencies do, but also to report out for transparency purposes to the public. And we think a multifaceted approach to evaluating the treatment of youth would provide for better outcomes for safer and more humane conditions. So just um, a few recommendations that we want to call from the testimony that we've provided to you, the written testimony. Um, we think the increase in treatment and programming at appropriate levels um, for staff would uh, prevent idle time and improve outcomes. We think that an increase in staffing and training would certainly improve outcomes. We think that um, arresting youth for physical uh, altercation should be a last resort, and we, really, we urge um, programming to include interventions that are both appropriate for youth with mental health needs as well as um, provide behavioral modification techniques and restorative practices. We again echo the need for the increase in training and hiring additional staff to alleviate burdens on overstressed staff. With regard to the um, LGBTQI community, um, while we are encouraged by ACS's efforts to um, create a culturally competent environment, we um, also ask that they uh, meet the requirements of PREA. We want to ensure that they are meeting the requirements of PREA, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, by ascertaining which youth identify as LGBTQI and ensure that those youth receive the individualized safety assessments that they require. Uh, we want to make sure that that's in place. And lastly, as um, the, I laid out more fully in the testimony, we would like to see the development and implementation of a multidisciplinary oversight body. I think Nancy has more to add. Um, I'd just like to address the, oh, sorry. I'd just like to address the issues that came up earlier about the increase in the percentage of juvenile offenders. Um, and I would like to emphasize that despite the fact that those kids are charged by definition with more serious crimes, they are not necessarily violent in the facilities. And what we, what we do see is that the juvenile offenders, the, the youth, the four, mostly 14 and 15 year olds who are charged with violent felonies in Supreme Court, their cases last much longer and they spend much longer periods of time in secure detention waiting for their cases to wend through the court system. And this can be very, very stressful for these kids and for their families. And often what happens is that they will receive family visits and the, their family will dump their anxiety on the child and then the child walks back into the facility with that increased anxiety. And mostly what we see is when the kids act out behaviorally, it masks tremendous sadness, depression, um, and anxiety that they do not have the tools to manage. And I could not really agree with Dr. Branson more that it is very difficult to manage a group of kids trying to manage this kind of, this set of issues without the tools to do that when you as the adults do not have the tools 
to help those kids. And so we do credit ACS. We, since Bellevue has gone into the facilities, we have seen a tremendous uptick in at true identification of the kids' mental health diagnoses and true treatment, and we believe that that has contributed to a much better environment. There's much more coordination of treatment between the treatment providers and the frontline staff, but I could also not agree with Dr. Branson more that this is an incredibly stressful environment, both for the teenagers in that building and the adults and the adults need a lot of support and they need not to be working double shifts constantly. You can't be exhausted when you're going into those facilities. They usually go home to their own children and have to deal with the problems and the issues that their own families have and then they come back <laughs> and all of the trauma from their, their own life comes in and gets compounded in that building and we have seen staff really, really work for our kids, really advocate for our kids, try to help them manage the issues that they're dealing with. We have also seen staff struggle and there needs to be support for those staff who are struggling and to try to raise their level of competency so that they can address the needs of those kids. As far as um, what Dr. Branson was talking about, about the Rikers reform, I can say I sit on the Adolescent Reform Advisory Board and we have seen, I, I would have to say, remarkable advances in the adolescent building on Rikers Island. And it is true that there was a lot of resistance in the beginning, but ACS actually has taken part in that process and DOC has adopted many of the practices that they are using in secure detention to the staff benefit and to the youth's benefit. And so this is a very complicated area um, where I think many, many jurisdictions are struggling with this because of the level of need among these populations and within the neighborhoods that feed the court system. And so until we can really address the percentage of neglect and abuse that these kids are exposed to, the violence in their neighborhoods, the violence in their homes, the, the issues of lack of services and lack of identification of their issues prior to detention, we're never going to make real progress. And I think that we are certainly getting there but there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done in their communities so that they can be connected with services prior to arrest, hopefully preventing arrest. Um, and hopefully at some point we will see fewer and fewer kids end up in detention and the kids who do end up there will come in as a healthier group overall. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for what you do for young people. I, I, I have a few questions. You mentioned, too, that we need more staff. But what I hear from the other side is that since the population has greatly decreased, uh, that we have more than enough staff. So how do, since we have less kids, now the ratio between staff and student has become smaller and become more manageable. Did, did you mean to say that we have need rather than more staff, but better trained staff? I really think it's both. Okay. I think that there are certain kids, and we've certainly seen this on Rikers as they move through this reform. There are certain kids in the highest need group where the ratio for those kids can be two to one, or one to one, or three to one, where it is an all day behavior modification model, where they really work with those kids until they can rejoin a general population and not upset the larger group. You happen to know what the ratio is right now, by chance? On insecure detention? Yes. I think it's still one to eight. Eight to one. one. To eight. eight to one, yeah. Okay. So I, I think we're not asking for a massive influx of staff, right. but 
I think part of the problem, and perhaps once the training is enhanced, when you have a, a body of, of workers who are traumatized and are stressed out, they tend to call in sick a lot. And I think that we hear that a lot from mm -hmm. the detention facilities that people just don't clock in. And then other staff members have to cover for them. And so it's more of a staff management. And I, we do believe that if services are enhanced for staff and they receive more support, and better training that you are less likely to see that phenomenon. It's not so much an overall number of staff that are going into these buildings, it's who actually shows up and who's available for these, for the kids and for each other as supports to the staff. I, I uh, also heard about having more mental health services. Can you be a little bit more specific? Because right now, I thought we had like the best of the best uh, not only in mental health, but also in act, um, also recreation activities. I mean, the overall plethora of, of services that they get, and 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 from the best. I mean, we we had Carnegie Hall from Bellevue, NYU. Uh, we have the best legal services. I mean, so I, I'm just curious to know what else do we need? I just speak to programming, and um, one of the com consistent complaints that we get is that not all. Not all programming is available to all youth. So there may be difficulties between youth on a particular unit, and so certain youth can attend programming and other youth are kept from programming. But they're and kept because... It, they may, kept. it may be because there is conflict between youth that needs to be addressed, and the same for even school programming, whether a kid may be brought to school or not. So while those are, you know, there certainly are challenges in managing youth that are in conflict with, with each other, um, and which is why we need sort of this collaborative approach with mental health and we need behavioral um, interventions and we need restorative practices to resolve that conflict. Um, not all programming is available to all youth to keep all youth occupied in a, very, in a constructive way. So it may not be necessarily bringing in additional programming, but making sure that all programming is available to all youth. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Barry. Council Member Perkin has a question. So, uh, significant in this uh, testimony is that race matters significantly. Uh, and, um, but it doesn't respond to that racism. That's, but it acknowledges it, but it doesn't respond to it. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? We, you point out that the city jails are almost exclusively poor African American or Latino experience and trauma, significant social issue beyond poverty, and et cetera. And they, you identify the communities for the most part, Brownsville, et cetera, that they come from. So if, if racism is, is kind of a, a, a evident in this, how do we deal, how do you, how do you, how do you what are you saying we yeah. should do? Well, I mean, I would suggest that racism exists um, you know, across the board, which is leading to and driving to the disproportionate minority contact between youth and police, youth and um, the courts, and then youth that are being then directed to detention. So this is a much bigger challenge. And what we're seeing is, um, and I think we, these, these numbers are significant, and each and every time we testify, we try to uh, make sure that the council understands who we're talking about, who these youth are. They are, come from the same five, 10 zip codes in New York City um, from the same communities. So certainly culturally competent services are um, important to the uh, training for staff, but what we want to make the point also that the staff come from the same communities. And so it's not as if we're suggesting that the staff are acting in a manner that's racist towards the youth, but there are racial uh, factors that are certainly driving the number um, uh, who, who is admitted to these facilities. I guess my concern is um, <clears throat> the, 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 I consider the youth the victims of, of something called racism. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not judging the staff mm -hmm. because they, they're just fortunately employed and hopefully committed mm -hmm. uh, to the concerns that, you're, you, that we all have. But, the, but it's sort of um, missing a point if we don't look at what's driving this population into prisons. Absolutely. Disproportionately 
almost exclusively compared to other communities. So where do we take this when we recognize that it's something bigger than, than the neighborhood? Well, I think that if there were anywhere close to sufficient services in the communities where they live, starting from birth, kids would be identified earlier. They would probably not develop the same trajectory of issues that they develop as they age into teenage, into their teenage years. So what we see often when we, let's say, intake a 15-year-old in Supreme Court, we see a child who's been struggling in school since he entered school in kindergarten. We see a child who is not necessarily identified appropriately with learning disabilities. They're often over-identified as having emotional disturbance. And even when they're identified with emotional disturbance, they don't receive appropriate mental health care to address address that emotional disturbance. There is not, there are not enough services for children with true learning disabilities and the children who do have true learning disabilities at a young age to become more and more frustrated as they move through the grades and they start to act out as they get older. And often what we see are kids who started as being diagnosed with learning disabilities who are now being um, labeled as emotionally disturbed because based on the fact that they're acting out because they failed to receive services to address their learning disabilities. They often come from families with generational histories of mental illness that has either gone unidentified or untreated. Um, the level of mental health service in many of these neighborhoods is beyond subpar. It, there are long, long waiting lists for parents, for siblings, and for the, these kids to access services. So if you can solve that, that would be great. <laughs> right, and the, you know, and, and certainly, I, you know, I, the backdrop to that is they, the, the youth live in more heavily policed communities. Um, their schools are policed, their communities are policed. Um, so, so for some normative behavior, some of the behavior we might see in family court less um, than in Supreme Court, we'll see a police or law enforcement response. Consequences, 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 not so much what's going on at home, what's going on um, with you, um, what's driving this, some of this normative adolescent acting out behaviors. And we need to, um, you know, not criminalize youth. And our position really isn't that there shouldn't be consequences because all kids need to learn that there are consequences to their behavior and they need to learn to modify that behavior. But the, if you don't address the reasons why they're getting into those issues, consequences never will solve the problem. The consequences, the easiest thing that we do is teach them consequences. We put them in jail for life. or for, We might as well put them in jail for life because once they go, they're crippled for life in many respects. But, the, but they're not the, um, the, the consequences should not, they should not be the ones to bear the consequences. It should be those who create the, <laughs> the, circumstances. the circumstances, the environmental circumstances, the lifestyle circumstances. So we're blaming the victim is what I'm saying, I guess. And, and we need to face that and, and recognize where do we get beyond them and get to what we're doing wrong systemically, racially, right. and with our prejudices that subject them to this inevitable consequence. Right. And what you're talking about largely, you know, we're talking about creating preventive measures, preventive measures that keep young people from coming into contact with um, what we perceive to be racist institutions where they're disproportionately represented. And that is, that is a tall order, but certainly um, we should be looking always at prevention. But I'm also saying we should also look at the racism that's taking place. Absolutely. Okay, because it's, it's not just a, some people seem to be prevented, and other people seem to be uh, quite the opposite. I think Exclusively that's Exclusively invited, yes. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. So I just want us not to miss the point that we have a bigger issue here at Absolutely. work in our communities, and, our, and, and that's 
affecting not just those who are the targets, but also it has a ripple effect that affects all of us. Absolutely. You know, even those who are white. Yeah, I think that's our point, is that the fact that we're only seeing five to eight neighborhoods feed the system is a demonstration that children in other neighborhoods that are better resourced are being prevented. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the panel coming and sharing their thoughts on this matter. I just wanted to briefly echo the, con the comments made by my colleague, uh, Councilmember Perkins, and that it's a system which is a manifestation of the racism that's embedded and the policies that continue to feed into a system where our children are incarcerated and in a perpetual uh, motion mm -hmm. of being in the system and providing that for the system until we address the conditions in the neighborhoods before children get into that. We've got to look to see what we're going to do in the system. Uh, the chair did arrange for some tours and I did go right. to Crossroads and Horizon and had a chance to talk with children. And my first love and my first profession is as a teacher and until we address the um, educational inadequacies that the system has forced on children and puts them in the situation where they're not at all prepared to read on a basic level or to comprehend and to dialogue and to debate and discuss, and until we give them the opportunities that will allow them to function uh, either in a standard um, business or in their own entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, pursuits, we're going to continue to see this. So I think it's more than just the education piece. It's more that it's a compilation of all of those measures that have to come together. And perhaps we need to uh, assign a definitive number of hours of education and the definitive number of counseling and make sure that our students who are in this system get those services that they need so that they, once they get out of the system, they don't come back and they don't, because the recidivism rate is very high. So I just want to thank you for coming in for your uh, presentation. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Thank Chair. You for your work. I want to thank uh, my colleagues for staying all the way to the end, and I want to thank you for coming and for all the other panelists. I thought today was very informative and very helpful, and we're going to take appropriate uh, next steps uh, forward. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, too.